Hi, this is James O'Keefe. I'm captain of the Massachusetts Pirate Party, and uh, welcome to another Pirate News. Uh, I'm joined today uh, by Steve Revelak, our first officer. Unfortunately, our quartermaster, Joe, uh, wasn't able to make it. Hope everything's going okay, and uh, that we hope for you all that you're having a wonderful weekend in the warm, not at all rainy weather today. Um, so a couple of things. First, we want to thank folks who joined us at the Trans Resistance March um, last weekend. Uh, we know we had a great time and uh, hope everyone there had a good time uh, going out. Uh, good, it was a good day, not too hot, uh, a little rainy at times, but uh, we all had a huge amount of fun and it was good to get out there in support of you know, the rights of our fellow, uh, <clears throat> the, the rights of our uh, fellow trans citizens, our fellow trans pirates, and uh, in support of personal bodily, uh, body autonomy. So uh, with that, we have an event coming up, um, the Boxborough uh, Pfeiffer's Day, uh, which we are planning to be at. Um, that is next set or this upcoming Saturday. If you're in the area and would like to help us table, please uh, reach out to us at info at masspirates.org or in, in the description below, you'll find a link where you can go and tell us you're planning to attend. Um, we also have a conference coming up for this summer scheduled for July 23rd at the Somerville Public Library West Branch at uh, uh, in Somerville. So, if you can attend, that's going to be from ten to twelve, ten a.m. to twelve thirty p.m. Uh, we'd like it if if you're in the area, you're in the Greater Boston area, and you want to join us. It's right an easy walk from public transit. Parking is really rather limited, um, but you know you could park at say the alewife station uh and then go one train stop and you're there so we hope you'll join us for that uh steve uh how have things been with you not bad um you know a lot of work going into sort of evolving a proposal for multifamily housing in Arlington. This is part of the quote unquote section 3A, otherwise known as multifamily requirements for MBTA communities, which was passed by the legislature, uh, I think in 2021. Wonderful. Um, and so if, uh, is that something that's open to anyone in the town of Arlington or? Uh, are only certain people uh, participating in that process? So there is, um, you know, our redevelopment board is participating. There is a uh, working group consisting that consists mostly of residents that's, you know, doing a lot of the outreach and handling public comments. But we're trying to make this a, we're trying to do a fairly extensive outreach program. Uh, we just had a public forum on this past Thursday to present sort of a draft map and some survey results and, you know, kind of explain how uh, we took the survey results, translated it into a map, and this will be sort of the foundation for our next iteration of the process. So there'll be public comments? In mm -hmm. the future? Yeah, so there will be opportunities for public comment in the future in the form of surveys and in-person events and, um, you know, what uh, and whatever else we happen to come up with. And will that eventually go before the elected town meeting? Yes, the plan is to bring it to town meeting in um, sometime this fall. We don't have a, a date, but you know, it's kind of looking like uh, late October, possibly. Great. Um, so we've got a couple of things to discuss. Uh, one topic that we're starting out with um, is that the U.S. Patent Office is proposing a rule to make it harder to kill bad patents. Uh, essentially, um, Congress passed a law that um, 
the patent office has to have a review process for patents um, such that um, people, corporations, nonprofits can challenge a patent and say, this patent is derivative, um, it is covering things that aren't really patentable, or an otherwise is a bad patent as a way of going after patent trolls who will manufacture, that is a loose word, there's no manufacturer that we might think of, we'll, we'll create out of whole cloth um, these patents that they then use to go after small businesses, large corporations, nonprofits, um, in an effort to basically extract money from them. Um, so one of the changes that the patent office is proposing is to limit um, limit it such that certain for-profit entities would not be allowed to bring challenges. Um, in addition to that, if there were, as they say, if a patent holder is an individual inventor or a startup or is an under-resourced innovator, then they would be completely protected and you wouldn't be able to challenge their patents. Um, which on its face of it is ludicrous because it's through shell corporations, it is possible for large corporations or for patent trolls to make it look like, oh, this is an individual, they came up with this patent. Meanwhile, that's all the, the real money behind it is all hidden away. Um, and then at some point, once it's been reviewed, they could, of course, since patents can last um potentially, um, you know, certainly uh, up to a, up to two decades, um, potentially, they could sell that, they could create this patent, have some lawyer who created it, and then lo and behold, the lawyer sells it to one of these patent, you know, patent uh, troll corporations, for a small sum, and then that entity would then go after people. Um, so essentially, this ruling, if it's allowed, would limit what Congress has done in terms of being able, allowing individuals uh, to challenge patents and allowing even corporations to challenge patents, who often have the money to look up um, any prior art or uh, any information that could invalidate the patent. You know, they have the money to do that, and so they're more likely to do it. Um, and this would take our right to challenge what our government has done in the granting of said patents um, and take it away from us. So you have until the 20th of June to submit your formal comments. There's a link in the description below. Uh, we urge everyone to go and um, submit their comment. Uh, we also link to an EFF article, which has boilerplate um, text you could use. Uh, we recommend that you don't necessarily use that in whole. You know, you could use that as part of your comment. Um, but I wouldn't recommend, you know, you comments are more likely to be looked at if they don't look cookie cutter. So by all means, and you don't even need to say a lot. You could just simply say, this is going to harm our ability to challenge bad, bad patent laws. And, um, that is going to allow, you know, well-financed patent trolls to hide, you know, they will hide how they're funding these patents um, and get around the, you know, small innovator, um, you know, <clears throat> get around those small innovator limitations, use them to their advantage. So please go fill it out. You have until the 20th. Uh, the more comments there, the better. Um, 
we don't have to have Congress pass yet another law. They already passed laws to kind of challenge patent trolls. Why should we have to go back and do this again? So please, please submit your comment. Um, with that, uh, we have an anniversary, Steve. You want to talk with us about that? Or sorry, well, you were going to say something about this patent shenanigans going on. I well, yes, I, I do have something to say about an anniversary, but I want to talk about patent shenanigans first. Um, as someone who's had the experience of working at a company uh, that was sued by a patent troll, um, you know, at the also named in the suit were lucky for us because we were fairly small at the time. Uh, were companies like Google and Amazon. Uh, <laughs> uh, otherwise, it would have been a little bit harder to mount the defense. I mean, the one thing that I you know want to point out is that the idea, you know, a patent is an idea essentially, and you know, no, a patent is an expression of an idea. Expression of an idea. Fine, fine. Yeah. Sorry, I just uh, too too many people are like, you can copyright an idea, you can patent an idea. You you, you can't. You have to. It has to be a tangible expression about what the process is in the case of a patent. Not so, like I can go and create this widget, but literally how you are supposed mm -hmm. to be able to create the widget. Sorry, go on. Yeah, so one of the things that in the patent world that kind of irks me are what are called non-practicing entities. So uh, the uh, uh, more you know, colloquial way of saying this is patent troll, but these are companies who don't do anything but happen to purchase and license patents. And, you know, the, there are a lot of, you know, I, I have a lot of sympathy for the patent office in terms of, you know, they're, they're attorneys, they're, they review what they view, but they're not, you know, necessarily subject matter experts in all of the, the different areas, particularly when it comes to things like software, where there are just so many darn moving parts, you know, patents can make a lot of sense in, um, you know, in the sense, maybe in a pharmaceutical industry where you're, or a chemical industry where you're patenting a molecule with a specific chemical structure. But in the world of software, um, there's just, you know, there's too many moving parts. And you patents know, on math, you can't have patents on you math. Can't have that's what patents. Software patents are, yeah. You can't have patents on math. That, that's basically, right. that's basically the, the idea, but you know, non-practice, non, -pract non practicing entities, you know, and these, a lot of the, you know, their business model isn't, you know, what they want to do ultimately is extract money. So basically they'll hit you with a lot of, they'll, you know, threaten to sue you for a lot of money. And if it looks like you fight it, you're planning to fight it, they will, you know, typically settle. But you know, they'll still settle for something, which means it's a still a profitable venture for them. You know, having the ability to invalidate a patent, you know, particularly by showing um, prior art or that the uh, idea was obvious to, you know, someone with knowledge in the field is, 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 is very, very useful um, in order to fight these things. And yeah, I, I think this one is worth commenting on end of rant about patents and you know there's a joke in there about you know um ha about patent suits are all originating from this little office park in texas because that's where the trolls have their office <laughs> but yeah i mean the only other thing that i that i would add thank you for that steve is the the patent office is not very good at looking at a patent and being like, yeah, that's, we've seen that before. You know, so many patents have been granted. Here is this known process, but it's done on the internet. And thus you, you get a patent for it. And it's like, why? <laughs> or, you know, you get a, you get a, um, you take a known process and you say that, well, this involves the use of a computer. 
And now it's a, no, 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 no. <laughs> that is not, um, you know, that, that does not qualify you for a new invention any more than, um, yeah, no, it does not. <laughs> right, but so, you know, if, if they're awful about, if they're more likely to just rubber stamp these patents and we don't have recourse to be able to challenge them, um, and certainly those who have the money and the incentive to challenge them uh, are not allowed to, then, you know, we're going to get even more patents, uh, bogus patents out there that are just going to stifle innovation. Um, you know, just because you have a large number of patents doesn't mean you're actually, you know, innovating or creating new mm -hmm, things. Mm -hmm. But um, so again, what's it the anniversary of Steve? Oh yeah. The anniversary. So somewhere around 10 years ago, in fact, yeah, 10 years ago, um, I don't know if it was necessarily to the day, but it was right around this time of the year. Uh, a fellow named Edward Snowden started collaborating with a reporter from The Guardian to release a number of basically classified documents that he had um, exfiltrated from the, you know, from the NSA while working there as a contractor. And one of these, what these documents did was to reveal a tremendous, well, a large and varied number of programs, uh, NSA programs, not computer programs, but, you know, agency programs uh, that in, were essentially involved collecting the communications of uh, users and, you know, thwarting you know, basically putting back doors and breaking encryption schemes for commercial providers, uh, Google in particular, who was, I, I think was, was rather sore about this and, you know, and, and, and so on. Um, now, aside from that anniversary, it is also sort of coming the, the, the other anniversary that's sort of coming up is, uh, Section 702, which is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. This was a, a law that came, was passed in the 19, late 1970s. And the idea was, you know, to authorize government agencies, you know, our, our national intelligence agencies to do conduct foreign surveillance, even though they happen to be on domestic soil. You know, you could, you could, you could spy on someone even uh, on, a, on, a, on a foreign person, even though you were still in the United States. One of the things that we've discovered, and part of this was through the Snowden revelations, is that well, in the process for doing that, there's actually a lot of domestic communication that ends up getting swept up, um, either intentionally or unintentionally. Um, like, for example, the, you know, the one of the NSA programs was called Co-Traveler, and the idea was to you know, if a person, if you have a person of interest and they, you know, are in the same proximity as someone else, could be an American citizen, that someone of else, someone else also becomes a person of interest. Or, you know, for if, um, you know, the idea of, you know, you're look you're looking at the communications of a person. Well, yeah. So there are first party communications, but they carried it out to like two and three hops. So one party of interest could get you, you know, halfway to um, to what Tom Cruise. The, I'm referring to the joke about you know there's six degrees of separation between everyone anyone and Tom Cruise. So anyway, Kevin um, Bacon. Oh, Kevin Bacon. Thank you for that correction. It was. I, I thought I didn't quite have that right, but so so thank you for that. But yeah, no, 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 no. sorry, <laughs> that's not Kevin Bacon, that's Tom Cruise. But whatever. <laughs> yeah, but in a lot of cases, although the law is ostensibly about you know conducting foreign intelligence surveillance on foreign operatives and uh, and that sort of thing, these programs have a history of being used to dis to spy on you know on domestic activists um, or, you know, 
recent examples being um like people who were doing George Floyd protests. A while ago, you had uh, people who were involved in the Occupy movement or, um, you know, anti-war groups like Code Pink and uh, Veterans for Peace and also people who were protesting uh, in the Capitol on January 6th of 2021. So, you know, one of the... You know, the FBI's director, um, the FBI's director has, you know, called 702 absolutely critical for the FBI to continue protecting the American people. And, you know, we cannot afford to lose it. But, you know, this sort of flies, ignores the, 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 what's a very basic fact that the system of checks and balances that works for most of government really does not work very well when it comes to national security programs. Um, you know, it took years to have some level of public visibility into what the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the FISA court, um, you know, their rulings and their hearings. And, you know, one of the things that we know from that is that, you know, the FBI um, kind of misused this data somewhere on the order of 278,000 times in like maybe a year. <laughs> um, you know, there's, you can, sure, we can, I mean, folks at the FBI or FBI leadership is saying, yes, we're going to improve our processes so that this doesn't happen again. But, you know, man, your your processes are pretty bad to start with. Um, and, you know, I, I'm I'm not really, I'm not really, sure that um you know so i i've never i've never really liked the fact of you know agencies any kind of agency acting sort of as their own uh watchdog and the the same is true for you know our you know our national security agency sorry guys but you know uh no <laughs> um one good thing that came out of the Snowden revelations, and you know, this is you know, from James Clapper, uh, who is a former director of national intelligence. You know, he estimates that the Snowden releases accelerated, you know, commercial adoption of encryption technologies by de by by years. Um, and this was, you know, the big tech companies didn't take kindly to. Um, three-letter agencies poking poking holes in their network, um, intercepting traffic and just, you know, messing with them generally. I happen to think this is a good thing. Uh, the more we encrypt, the better. Um, you know, encryption, you know, going back to the ideas of math, you know, strong encryption protects everyone. Um, and, you know, I understand that there is, you know, the law agencies will say, well, then we can't get the bad guys. And, you know, I, you know, I'm not ready to make that concession. Um, I, I, I'd like to see the, I think, you know, y'all got to try harder first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, again, it's just like, you know, as a country, we sort of, we swing on a pendulum. So once we found out about uh, Hoover's surveillance abuses, I'm referring to Edward J. Hoover, the former director of the FBI. We kind of J. Edgar Hoover. Hey Edgar Hoover. Hoover. Thank you. I'm, I'm lousy with sure. names. Today. But you know, once we found out about you know those those abuses, we kind of enact put some safeguards in, and then September 11th happened, and then we pulled them kind of threw them out the window and you know then the snowden revelations and we get them back a little bit but anyway the um the section 702 is up for renewal and we'll have to see what congress does with it um although for my personal opinion you know if folks are interested in cutting the budget i got a suggestion for you Yeah, this service costs money, man. <laughs> or contracts to, you know, Halliburton or whomever. Uh, those aren't cheap. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I mean, I, like, I'm, I'm still amazed looking back 10 years that there were companies that did not encrypt internally. That maybe they encrypted 
from the customer to their internal servers. But they were like, oh, well, our servers are within our own network. No one's going to get inside of them. And the NSA is, hold my beer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they stuck servers that would just that would just hoover up, shall we say, all of their communications that went through unencrypted. And so, you know, it's important to do encryption to from your computer to their computer, but it's also important for them to do encryption within their own service, within their own computers mm -hmm. uh, and to not you know, not keep as much information around on people. You know, if you don't, I mean, I know I've done trainings on this. If if you don't need to keep the information, don't gather it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, can't, it can't be leaked. It can't be exploited if it's not there. Yeah. Um, speaking of exploitation, <laughs> um, uh, so I'm just going to mention mention this that that came out. Apparently, uh, Matteo Ventura, who's 18, of Wakefield, Massachusetts, um, was held last Wednesday in federal court in Worcester. Um, the FBI claims that he was uh, going to send money to ISIS or was trying to go. I, I believe they they said uh, was planning on helping ISIS, and that they arrested him. What's funny is, you know, he was talking with their informant, and then he's like, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I got hurt. I can't go and wage jihad wherever ISIS is anymore. I got hurt." And it turns out he wasn't hurt, but he just wanted to not do this anymore and so that's when the fbi stepped in and we're like now we're going to arrest you like aren't there white supremacists out there like that was like known <laughs> like on twitter now <laughs> you know? yeah i mean there's i um i think there's a certain mindset that is stuck at a point in time that's 20 years ago um today i think domestic terrorism is a much more significant problem um and has caused more casualties than um than foreign terrorism yeah and those are actually you know when when people show up at um a you know, a drag show and then start to beat people, you know, white supremacists uh, start to attack people who are just trying to defend people exercising their First Amendment mm -hmm. right. Um, that, that, you don't need to entrap a kid for that. <laughs> you don't yeah. need to manufacture that it's already there these people are already there using violence to take the rights away of other people it's not hard you don't need to create something mm -hmm. speaking of taking things from other people namely us <laughs> um i will point out that donald trump was indicted for taking multiple tens, over a hundred, uh, certainly many uh, public documents that he didn't have the right to keep in classified. random boxes about Mar-a-Lago. Classified documents. Yes, we overclassify, but hey, while we have the rules, the rules is the rules, and they should apply to everyone. Damn it. I mean, especially since his whole thing in 2016 was, oh, Hillary Clinton went and took all of these classified documents and made them vulnerable. That she 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 made us vulnerable, and here he is taking them and like showing them to random people, leaving them in bathrooms that look cheap but have chandeliers. Which we that's a whole another story, but it's like wall of boxes you can go into the bathroom and just start opening up a box and looking through grabbing some of those documents sticking them in your pants and walking away i mean there, there was literally pictures of them just sitting in a 
ballroom stage that obviously when there aren't, you know, people in the ballroom, people could just walk in and peruse at their leisure. <laughs> yeah, I'm just waiting for, I'm expecting the, oh, but her emails merchant, I'm expecting the, oh, but her emails merchandise to show up like any minute now. <laughs> I mean, it's the, it's the same thing that you see, right? I mean, it's always rules for, you know, rules for thee, but not for me, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they, 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 they strengthen, they strengthen, well, they made the, they made it harder. They made it easier to go after people who um, take these classified or top secret documents and Trump wanted this to happen, and now he's going to get hoist by his own petard. So, you know, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Yeah, yeah. And so with that, we want to thank you for watching this Pirate News. We hope you found it helpful. As always, you can find us at masspirates.org. Uh, if you want to join us next, uh, this upcoming Saturday uh, at a you know, tabling, telling people about how to protect their privacy, about the pirate party, please do, um, you know, fill out the form linked below. Uh, please go and fill out the, uh, submit a formal comment by the 20th of June about this BS uh, U.S. Patent Office rule they want to ram down our throats. Um and as always, if you like this, please share, um, you know, subscribe to us and, um, you know, sign up for our mailing list. You can find that at a link below at masspirates.org. Uh, so we hope you all have a wonderful week. We hope to see you next week. If not, it'll probably be the week after that. Uh, we try to do these weekly, but that isn't always the case. So um, have a wonderful week. And thank you very much, Steve. I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you, Jamie. You as well. Take care, folks. Bye. And we are done.